is taking the weekend off uh, to be with his family. Aren't we blessed with a wonderful pastor and amen, his wife. So pray for them to be refreshed. But you know what that means. It means you're stuck with me for the next, oh, however many minutes. We're going to have, I know, I know. Anyway, we're going to have a great time together, though. And I'm really looking forward to studying God's Word with you. So let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing in, his time of the, in, in our time of the Word. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to study your Word right now. Father, we are praying, Father, that this moment in time, Lord, that, that our attention would be undivided. We're not thinking about the... The, the next day, the next year, we're focused on meeting you and learning from you all that you have for us from your word. Please, Father God, give us ears to hear. Please, Father God, give us eyes to see. And if there's any hardness over our hearts, please soften it that we may walk in your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen and amen. We are in Genesis chapter 32 today. Genesis 32. We're going to pick up the story in verse 22 all the way to verse 32. And the title of my message is, When Your Past Meets Your Present. You know you're in trouble with a title like that one. Hold on, kids. It's going to be a long ride, right? It's going to be fun. Amen. Hey, so the holidays are kind of almost over. So it's fair for me to ask the question. What's your worst holiday memory? <laughs> Anyone got any? Not that I want you to share right now. I'm going to share with you. Unfortunately, I've got two. And both of them, unfortunately, are rather recent. One of them was last year. One of them was this year. Now, some of you have heard the first one last year. It's the famous, in the Dodd house, turkey brine blunder. Uh, yeah, Terrible, terrible, devastating thing that happened. We like to brine our turkeys for Thanksgiving. It's a great way just to, you know, what you do is you take the butter ball and you put it inside this bag and you put this brine mixture in there and it just, the turkey absorbs the brine. Well, last year, uh, I don't know what happened. I mean, I really don't know what happened. Uh, the, the butter ball was in the bag, okay? And the bag is sitting on the island in our kitchen, Okay? And I have hold of the trash bag. And all I need to do is hold the trash bag as my beautiful wife pours the brine into the bag. But somewhere along the way, I heard words you never want to hear your wife say when you're holding the bag. Honey, the bag. Somewhere along the way, I let go and brine contaminated turkey brine went all over the kitchen, okay? We're talking all over us. We're talking under the refrigerator. We're talking onto the carpet. We're talking into the drawers where all the towels are. Everything is contaminated by turkey brine. At some point, my wife says, just, just go to bed and I'll clean up, okay? And, and guys, you never want to hear your wife say these words when she comes to bed, but I, I distinctly remember her hearing her say this, we're going to have a good Thanksgiving anyway. <laughs> we're going to have a good Thanksgiving anyway, okay? <laughs> but I want you to know, this year, I did not fumble the butter ball, okay? I want you to know, yes, Woo! that's right. I did not fumble the butter ball. I held on to the bag. We made sure the bag was not on top of the island, but down on the ground, and properly contained to minimize any exposure if I made a mistake. That was bad. But what happened recently is far worse. It's confession time. This is a good one. Actually, it was a terrible one, okay? Nothing good about this at all. I call this the Wendy's Chicken Nuggets Catastrophe, okay? So we were in Washington. We're visiting relatives and we're on our way back down. It's a late Sunday night, and Melina is hungry, and she needs to use the restroom. So we're coming down I-5 in Seattle, and so we see a Wendy's, and we thought, you know, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll pull into Wendy's, and I'll drop off Heidi and Melina. They'll use the restroom, and I'll go through the drive through and I'll pick them up right where I dropped them off. Long line at Wendy's. What were these people thinking in Seattle? It's 9 o'clock at night. What are they doing eating this late? It's not healthy. Anyway... Um, the line takes forever. 
And uh, I place my order, and all of a sudden, Heidi comes out on the driver's side, the drive through side, and, and starts to get into the car. And um, so she's buckling Melina in, and uh, suddenly, the car in front of me moves forward, and the drive through window's empty, and again, I don't know what I was thinking, guys. I pull forward. And I heard something you really don't want to hear from your wife, okay? Honey, you just ran over my foot. True story. And you're probably thinking, I forget the rest of this sermon. That turkey just ran over his wife's foot. It's true. I ran over my wife's foot. Praise God, there wasn't any broken bones. Nothing was broken, but I felt terrible. So I just ran over my wife's foot. Can you believe it? Can you see why this is far worse than the turkey brine blunder? Because, you know, it's one thing to hear your wife say, we're going to have a good Thanksgiving anyway. It's another thing to hear your wife say, you just ran over my foot. I know. Poor Heidi. She's married to me. That's my worst nightmare. She's such a trooper, though. She says to me, she goes, I'm sorry, I, I raised my voice a little bit. And I said, honey, I'll give you that one. I just ran over your foot. <laughs> you, know, you know, for some, though, the reality is, I'm just confessing my, my worst nightmare. For some, though, what frightens us the most is our past. I'm not judging here, but the truth is all of us have made mistakes. Amen. And all of us know the feeling, the anxiety that overwhelms you when you come face to face with your past. Today we're going to discover how God confronted the past that Jacob, Israel's patriarch, tried to run and hide from. And I believe by doing so we will see how God, and this is so important today, he wants to liberate us from our past that we may experience his victory in every one of our tomorrows. Let's pick it up in verse 22. Now, he, Jacob, arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream. And he sent across whatever he had. Verse 24, then Jacob was left all alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak and when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, Please, tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of his hip. Now, a little context is helpful. At this point in the narrative, in the story, Jacob was 97 years young at this point in his life. For 20 years, he served his uncle Laban, who, by the way, if you read about Laban, he was the master deceiver. I mean, really, he was the master deceiver. Jacob went from a 77-year-old, failure to launch, mama's boy, to a wealthy man with two wives, two maids, ten sons, and one daughter. Talk about playing catch up there, okay? Now, during the last six years of his time serving Laban, Jacob became very wealthy. He acquired goats, sheep, cattle, camels, donkeys, and servants. And that wealth created problems for him, especially with his relatives. They became very jealous in their hearts. And in fact, at one point, he was in danger. 
he felt threatened, that he was going to lose it all. So according to Genesis 31, God commanded Jacob to move back to the land of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, the promised land, the land of Canaan. But here's the problem. Jacob had to pass through the land of Seir, the country of Edom where his big brother Esau lived. Suddenly, Jacob's past came back to haunt him and threatened to interfere with his future. And it's important for us to understand that when our past meets our present, we have to have something in mind from God's perspective when this happens. God wants to bless our tomorrows. Jacob wanted to run away from his past, and all of a sudden, he's confronted with his past once again. What's going on here, God? And we need to have as an understanding deeply settled within our hearts, no matter what our past has been, God wants to bless our tomorrows, but God confronts the past we wish to forget. They're both true. He wants to deal with the past, and he wants to bless our tomorrows. Now, to put it nicely, Jacob and Esau, they had issues. You read the story, it began actually when they were in their mother's womb. Their mom actually prayed to God, what's going on? Because there was this tug of war going on in her belly. And God revealed that the twins that were in her belly were two nations. And one would serve the other, the older would serve the younger. Okay? Jacob comes out second, Esau comes out first. Esau is red and furry like a, a little fur ball, a little head, hairy garment, you know? And here is Jacob, and he's holding on to the heel. Imagine that as he's coming out of his mother's womb. Jacob, heel grabber, supplanter. That's the idea. And we see this in Jacob's life. He snatched Esau's birthright for a cup of stew. Wanted to be first. Not, not only that, but he actually deceived his father, who was blind at the time, so that he could steal Esau's blessing. Esau, when all this went down, he had enough. He was a hunter, an outdoorsman. And so what did he want to do? He wanted to kill Jacob. That was the only thing that made him feel satisfied. Jacob got word of it, and he decided to move on. But 20 years later, God told Jacob to move back home. When Esau got word, the fact that Jacob was coming back, guess what he did? We are told in this chapter that not only did he come out to meet Jacob, he brought 400 men with him. 400 men. Now, why would God tell Jacob to go home if going home meant seeing Esau? This is important for us to hold on to here because God was confronting the past Jacob had run from. And the truth is the same for us. We have made poor choices, right? We have broken relationships, right? Some of us have struggled with addictions, with drugs, with alcohol, with pornography, and, and whatever else that's out there, right? We've made these types of choices. And those choices come back to haunt us. And we, we want to forget the, the reality that they exist. But we need to realize God wants to liberate us from those things. And the way you're liberated is not by pretending they didn't exist. God's not afraid to tackle these things head on so that you can move forward and be stronger still. When Jacob heard Esau was on his way, we are told in verse 7 that he was greatly afraid and distressed. Translation, Jacob was having a major meltdown. He is freaking out. And you see this with people whenever the past comes back to haunt you. What do you want to do? You want people to perceive you a certain way, so you are manipulating and controlling because you want the outcome to be favorable for you. And you look at Jacob's actions, and it's true to form. I mean, he is grappling. He's struggling. He's looking for some way, some way that he would have a favorable outcome here. We are told that he divides the camp in verses 7 through 8. If he attacks one, the other one will get free. He even shoots up a prayer for deliverance, but it almost seems like a foxhole prayer. 
Oh, God, help me now. I need you, you know? A genie in the bottle. Lord, help me on this one. Please, you're the one who told me to come here anyway. Please help me out. And then he also sends Esau gifts. And when you calculate the number, it's five, over 550 animals. I know I stole the birthright. I know I stole the blessing. I hope this makes up for it a little bit. Spreads it out a little bit. And you see Jacob's motivation. He's hoping to wear Esau down with kindness. We see it in verse 20 of chapter 32. I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterwards I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So God confronts because he wants to bless our tomorrows. You see, ultimately, God wants to use and he uses our past to bring about change for us. This is so essential for us. This is God's goal, to change you and me. What does he want to do? He wants to build our faith. He wants to strengthen our character. He wants to purge the manipulation out of the manipulator. You know who I'm talking about. You just spent Christmas with them, right? <laughs> uh, he wants to prune the control out of the control freak. I love the words of Martin Luther, catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. He said, a Christian is never in a state of completion, but always in the process of becoming. Isn't that true? There's never a time when we've arrived and whenever we think, I've got it made, there's something else that God's going to reveal, but the goal is to strengthen us, to build up our faith, to bring us to a place where we're not controlling, we're not manipulating, but we're leading in a godly way. Now, how can you tell the difference between the two? How can you tell between manipulation and control versus godly leadership, which God wants us to exercise? Manipulation and control is all about me and how I appear and my agenda, my outcome that I want to achieve. What is godly leadership? Godly leadership seeks to glorify God and build others up in Christ. There's a big difference between the two. And what we have in the church today and in our culture is a whole lot of manipulation and control, and we need godly leadership. We need godly leadership in our homes. We need godly leadership in our work, in our schools, in our churches. Amen? Because it's for him and for his glory. Now, this is important. Jacob thought that Esau would keep him from God's blessings and promises. But ultimately, God was showing Jacob that Jacob was keeping Jacob from the promises and blessings of God. God would not allow Jacob to enter the promised land as Jacob. Jacob needed to change, and God used his past to pave the way for a blessed future. And many today carry their past around them, with them. The very past they're trying to forget, and, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there's that guilt, there's the shame, there's the failure the addictions, the, the pain you've inflicted on others and the pain you've inflicted upon yourself. And we need to see that when we have our past confront us again, the choice is that God wants to do something through it, that he wants to use our past to bless our tomorrows. God is working all these things for good. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.6. Listen to these words. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm comforted by that because I've made my share of mistakes like you have, right? And I'm so thankful that when others would give up on me, guess what? God never does and he won't give up on you either. He's not done. For those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, there's a work that he has set out to complete. And for those who haven't come to faith in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do so because you don't have to remain as you are. God wants to set you free. He does. Now, why would Jacob, though, live the way he lived? Why do we live the way we live sometimes? You know, why did he control? Why did he scheme? Why did he manipulate when, in fact, before he was born, there was a promise that he would be the leader, that he would receive the blessing, Ultimately, I think it comes down to the fact that he didn't believe in God. 
He did not trust God. So another component here that we need to see in the story and in our lives when our past meets our present is this. God confronts our unbelief. God is confronting our unbelief. You do not have a relationship with God if you do not have trust. I've counseled people before. I remember this one guy. He's in, he's in my office, and he kept on saying, but I trust God, but I trust God. But there was a problem. He kept on using the word but and then trust God right afterwards, and he kept on complaining. It's not good enough. It's not good. I said, you know what? You really don't trust God. No, no, I do, Pastor. I do. No, you, you, you really don't. And for some of us, and I would imagine it's by degrees, do we really trust him? That, that complete abandonment, I will trust you. You see, God is using these things to work out any unbelief. But here's the thing about God. He's not going to talk to you about these things when your ears are closed, your eyes are closed, and your heart is hard. He waits for a teachable moment. Like like we do with our kids, right? You're looking for that teachable moment when you will finally listen, right? When they're finally ready to hear what you have to say. When they sometimes even say, I need your help. Oh, thank God, I've been watching you have a meltdown here, and now you finally need my help. Well, God does the same thing with us. He's waiting for that teachable moment. And we see this in verses 22 and 23. He's, he's done everything. He's even sent his family away. He's all by himself. Jacob has done everything that he can do. There's no more schemes left in his bag of tricks. And in the middle of the night, Jacob was all alone with his fears, uncertain about his future. And that's the moment God's looking for. Some of you guys are going through that moment right now. And God's been waiting for that moment so that you will finally listen and let him do what he's been wanting to do all along. Bless your tomorrows by touching your past. He felt like he was all alone, but the reality is God was with him, and, and we're not alone ever, ever. It's interesting. I love these words out of Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. God's with us. Oh, Lord, it's hot. I know, but I'm with you. Oh, Lord, it feels like the waters are going to overflow me, and I... I won't be able to grab another breath. It's okay. I'll sustain you. Are you ready to listen now? Are you ready to hear? Charles Spurgeon once said, as sure as ever God puts his children in the furnace, he will be with them in the furnace. He's there. God's there. You see, because God, when he confronts, he confronts us because he loves us. He confronts us not because he's angry with us, not because he's done with us. He confronts us because he loves us. He's a good father, and he loves his children, and he's got a good plan for our lives. He's just waiting for us to have that teachable heart. Are you listening, my son? Are you listening, my daughter? I have something for you. I have the answer. You've been wrestling a long time. I'm waiting for that teachable moment. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you some things that's going to hurt, but what you will gain is far greater than anything you're going to give up because I love you. Hebrews 12, verse 7 and 10 puts it this way in the NIV. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. God, look at this, disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. God knows in you and you and you and in me exactly what needs to happen so we look more like Christ, that we're more holy. And everything he does is for our good. He's a good father. Now, it's important to note here that Jacob, he'd been wrestling with God well before there was an actual wrestling match. 
And I, I love this. It's God who took the initiative to wrestle with Jacob to show him something very profound and us as well, that this is how he's been living all 97 years of his life. And when we go through these things, could it be that God's trying to show us you've been wrestling all along? You've been wrestling all along. Now, I think Jacob probably thought he was wrestling with one of Esau's men. But the Bible reveals the true identity of Jacob's opponent. In fact, many scholars believe this was an angel of the Lord, different than any other angel like Gabriel or Michael. It was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He is wrestling with God. And you see this combination of ideas in Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. In the womb... He took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity, look at this, he contended with who? With God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel, the angel of the Lord, and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us, even the Lord, the God of hosts. The Lord is his name. This whole scene is just amazing to me. Why did God appear in the form of a man? I think it's very clear because Jacob was treating him like a man. And sometimes we do the same thing. Jacob's not the only one. God's frail. He's, he's finite. He's forgetful. He's, he's even unfaithful. He's a foe. He's not my friend. If God loved me, why would I be going through these things? But we must remember that God is not a man. You see, God is faithful, and he never forgets his people. I love this perspective in Isaiah 49, verses 14 through 16. This is what Israel's saying, Zion's saying. They're saying this, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Now God speaks into the situation. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but look at this. I will not forget you. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I'm not done with you yet. And even though circumstances feel like I've forgotten, I haven't forgotten you. I know you by name. I know the number of hairs on your head. I make it easy for him, by the way. But I, I haven't forgotten you. God's not unfaithful. He's not forgetful. He's not finite. Our God's all-powerful. Amen? And our our powerful God is always for his people. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who is against us? But I got all these troubles going on. There's more month than money in the bank account. My, my job's threatening layoffs. There's, there's struggles in my marriage. If God is for us, who can be against us? Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to line up where God is. If you're going through a difficulty in your marriage, can I encourage you? It's not about you being right. It's not about you winning the argument. You know what's going to heal your marriage? Jesus winning. Amen? It's about Jesus being right. Hey, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Don't you think he can take care of us? I believe so. Won't you trust him then? With every aspect of your lives. I'm at a dead end with my work. I don't see any dead ends. I have opportunities to, to share Christ. Look at it that way. That God's used you there as a tent maker so you can proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, we have to look at things from a completely different perspective. What I'm saying to you is this. We need to stop wrestling with God. Wouldn't that be a great way to end 2015 and start 2016? That's a New Year's resolution right there. (laughs) God, I choose to stop wrestling with you. I'm going to adopt a different posture entirely. I'm going to stop wrestling with you, and I'm going to cling to you instead. That's what we see here in Genesis 32. I find this so amazing. 
Jacob is actually wrestling with God. That blows me away that God would condescend to that degree to allow Jacob to wrestle with him to make a point, to help him understand what's been going on these 97 years that the remainder of his life may look entirely different, and he does the exact same thing with us. Now, I don't know if you know much about wrestling, but wrestling is an interesting sport. My, my son, Adam, he's a wrestler. 14 years old, he's a freshman in high school. And you know, wrestling, unlike any other sport, I mean, six minutes, if you go three or two minute rounds, you are wiped out. It's like almost like running a marathon. I mean, there is so much intensity there. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I really admire watching him wrestle. He just gets in there and, and he actually... <laughs> Let dad brag a moment here. Uh, not because it's me. He's doing this all on his own uh, by God's grace. Uh, I got a text message from him the other day. He got a chance to wrestle varsity as a freshman. Yeah, you're exactly right. And he said to me, God bless me today. So I thought, well, I got to give him a call. Before the match, the way things were lined up, he was supposed to wrestle last. And the coach jokingly said, you know, uh, Adam, the whole match is going to come down to you. <clears throat> Pressure's on, you know. The match starts, and, and his team is just smoking the other team, just whooping them. But halfway through, there's a turn. And all of a sudden, Adam's team's losing. The coach goes, uh, Adam, this really might come down to you. Last match of the evening, okay? His team is down by one point. Now, here's something you need to understand about my son. He wrestles 104, but 104, 106, but he actually weighs 94 pounds. So he gives up about 10% of his body weight. He's not only in the lightest weight class, he's the light end of the weight class, okay, as a freshman there. Down by one point, he gets in there. The kid weighs 12 pounds more than him. And he pins him in the first round in 30 seconds. Wow! You know, that's my boy right there. It happened so fast, my mom couldn't even record the match, okay? <laughs> Loved it. His whole team wins. It was an amazing opportunity and experience for him. And I look at my son, I go, this is just amazing that he would have the courage to do this. But I look at this story, and I'm thinking, what weight class is God? He's an entirely different weight class, <laughs> you know? I mean, he could have pinned Jacob like that. He could have squashed him like a bug and then some, right? But he allows him. He allows him to wrestle. And then when it was time to be done, the Lord merely touched Jacob's thigh, which is a symbol of Jacob's strength, and Jacob's hip was dislocated. With a touch... Not a twist or a torque. God revealed his superiority, but it's more than this. God also revealed he was Jacob's advocate, not his adversary. God was for him, not against him. Once Jacob's hip was dislocated, he couldn't run anywhere. He's done. But even better, I love this. Once Jacob realized he had met his match, he didn't want to wrestle and he didn't want to run. I love that. He cried out for a blessing and he held fast to the Lord. And I think this is the posture you and I need to take. That I'm not going to resist, Lord, what you're doing. I'm not going to kick against the goads. Lord, I have these struggles, but I'm going to cling to you. I'm going to trust you, Lord. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul. He had a thorn in the flesh, we we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he entreated the Lord three times that it would be removed. But listen to his words in verses 9 and 10. My grace, God speaking to him, is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Paul's response, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Today, is anyone tired of wrestling with God? Is 
anyone tired of wrestling with God? Some are wrestling with God, and here's a take on this that I want to add. Some of us are wrestling with God because we're trying to carry guilt and shame that God's already forgiven us of. Did you hear me with that one? You don't have to do penance. You don't have to punish yourself. If God says you're forgiven, then you are forgiven. Accept the grace of God and stop wrestling with Him. Amen? And walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What does that look like? It looks like this, that you're governed by God. I'm going to let you be the Lord. I'm going to let you reign. It's interesting. Jacob asked for a blessing. And God says, what's your name? Oh, Jacob's thinking, why do you have to bring that up? Heel grabber, deceiver, control freak, manipulator, supplanter. Take your pick. It's me. You see, in that day, one's name revealed their character. And it was very negative what his name came to mean at that time. Israel, though, that's the new name that God gives him, means God fights. God's prince, but also this, governed by God. Jacob, there's a new way I want you to live. You're my prince. I'm going to fight for you, and you're going to be governed by me. What a beautiful thing, huh? What a great way to live. I'm clinging to the Lord, and I'm allowing the Lord to govern the events of my life, my choices, Godly leadership versus worldly, fleshly, conniving manipulation and control. There's the difference, you see. Now, Jacob, he's saying, well, as long as we're talking about names here, what's your name? And God responds by saying, why do you ask? All you need to do, Jacob, is look at your new name. And the question is answered. Jacob got it. It was an aha moment. And that's why he named that place Peniel, because he saw God face to face, and he lived. And Jacob was never the same again. But that wasn't a bad thing either. Because remember, God wants to bring about change, godly change. He walked with a limp. Why would God make him walk with a limp? It was a reminder that you need to walk by faith and not by sight. But don't you know I'm going to be seeing Esau? i got to have my legs ready for me. Don't you know? No, you're going to walk by faith and not by sight. You're going to walk by faith and not by sight. For you and me, we're going to walk by faith, even if that means we're limping, and not by sight. You and me, we're going to hold on to the words of Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. Look at this. When I am afraid... I will put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God, I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Amen. But there's one more part I want to take a look at real quickly as we get ready to close here in a moment. What did the Lord mean when he said, you've striven with God and with men and have prevailed? Is he talking about the wrestling match? I don't think so. It's a reference, I believe, to God's heart for Jacob and for all who call upon him by faith. Look at the words again of Hosea 12, verse 4. It's not on the screen, but let me read these to you. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. How? He wept and sought his favor. When did the prevailing take place? When he stopped wrestling and he clinged to the Lord. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me because I know I'm in the presence of one who's superior to me. That touches my heart. Because I think we get a picture, a window into the heart, the father heart of God. You know, in our home, as we get ready for bed, we have these certain routines. And one of them is with our three-year-old daughter, Melina, 
is that we all go upstairs. All of our bedrooms are upstairs. We all walk up the stairs together. And she'll go, okay, clean up, clean up. Everybody do their share. He puts all the toys away. We all as a team put the toys away, you know. And, and then it's time for us to go up the stairs. And it's time for us to brush our teeth. It's time for us to pray. And, and it's time for us to go to bed. Well, one night, I was already upstairs. And I didn't want to go back downstairs. I'm already up here. And all of a sudden, Melina's at the bottom of the stairs saying, Daddy, where are you? I'm upstairs. Come on up. I'll be, I'll be waiting for you. No, Daddy. We have to go up the stairs together. Honey, it's okay. I'm already up the stairs. I'm going to stay right here. You just walk up the stairs with Mommy. She began to cry. No, Daddy, we do this together. We're a team. What do you think happened to this Daddy's heart? She prevailed upon my heart because she sought my favor, my presence. I want to go up these stairs together, Daddy. We're a team. Let's do life together, Daddy. We're a team. If my daughter can touch my heart like that, how much more so do you think it touches the Father's heart when we stop wrestling? We say, Daddy, I need you. Abba, Father, I need you. Amen? You don't have to strive for God's blessing. He already wants to bless you. He's just waiting for us to stop wrestling, to cling to him, to call to him, to do what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And our Abba Father will make our paths straight. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to study your word. And Lord, as we're getting ready to close 2015, we need you, Lord. Church with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're here today and, and you're saying, I will trust the Lord. I've been wrestling, but I want to finish this year right. I'm going to cling to God. I'm going to trust God because I know his heart for me that he wants to bless my tomorrows. If you're here today and you're saying, Lord, I want to go deeper still, no matter where your faith might be, as a little seed or much more developed than that, there's always room for us to grow stronger still. Would you raise your hand and just say, Lord, that's me. Lord, I raise my hand. I'm not going to wrestle. I want to walk by faith. I'm going to cling to you, Lord. No matter what 2016 holds, I will cling to you. Because I know if my God is for me, who can be against me? I will trust in you, Lord. No matter what comes my way. Father, you see the hands that are raised. And I thank you, Father, that as we raise our hands, we're prevailing upon your heart. have what we ask because what we need most of all is you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord thanks?